good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session about uh, accessible fonts. My name's Sarah Zama, and I am the UX videography and design manager at Sony Professional. This is actually my fourth, or I think it must be my fourth tech share um, this year. And so, and I'm just really, like, really delighted to be here, kind of sharing this session with these guys today. So in terms of audio description, I am a short, blonde, slightly overweight female, uh, carrying far too much from lockdown and wearing a black shirt, sitting in my living room with a picture of the prehistoric A to Z behind me on the wall. Um, I have shut the cats away, so hopefully things should go as planned. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So I'll be introducing you to our panel today. Uh, so we've got David Bailey and Gareth Ford Williams, isn't it? It's that extra bit. That's Gareth right. Ford Williams um, from the BBC and also Bruno Marg. And between them, they're going to be talking about um, this, this journey they took um, around the BBC, looking at pulling together this new BBC font that they worked on and there'll be a few uh, hints and tips as well at the end and looking at busting a few myths hopefully. So I will leave these guys to kind of introduce themselves. I believe David's going to go first so he'll tell you a bit about himself and then take you through um, the process that they went through at the BBC. So off you go. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. I'm David Bailey. I'm user experience principal for visual design and brand at the BBC. Um, if we're doing the audio description, I'm pretty bog standard white male beard glasses sat in a in a in a home office with a nice bookshelf behind me. It's actually in front of me, but there's a mirror behind me, so it looks like it's behind me. Anyway. Um, so I, I'm going to start this, 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 this talk off because we're going to take you on a little journey of a little tell a story of how we introduced a new typeface into the BBC, but actually what that uncovered for us along the way with regard to accessible uh, reading, etc. So um, I joined the BBC in 2014 as a user experience, print, as, no, as a creative director for our design framework. And really my remit was to kind of help sort of boost the profile of our design language around the business amongst our designers and for it to pour out to the wider business and understand how we design all of our fantastic services that we produce at the BBC uh, in a consistent way and accessible way etc so um, and when I arrived I sort of spotted an opportunity I think within within that framework for a new typeface because any key, any design language a key element of a design language or a brand is, is the font, is the typeface. And the typeface that we were using at the time across all of our services online was uh, Helvetica or Arial, if you're on a PC, which was the font we were using for our reading experience. We also had Gil Sans, which was the corporate typeface of the business. And both these typefaces were designed 100 years ago for the printed page. They don't perform well on today's modern digital screens. And they're both quite different. So there was a real opportunity to to push for a, a better um, visual sort of typographic tone of voice. Shall I keep going, Sarah, or is there, is it, yeah, okay. So um, uh, what, just after our design language, which we called the global experience language, which is our design framework, when that was launched in, it was it just shortly after it was launched, the first iPhone was launched and that saw this in exponential growth in, the consumption of the written word and articles, etc., on very small screens, um, which raises all sorts of issues around legibility and performance of typeface from a reading point of view, which we would, which we were dealing with at the BBC, um, and so there was so, and that was coming off the back of using these kind of somewhat old school kind of bog standard kind of typefaces, which hadn't been optimised for digital screens. Um, and so we had this opportunity to sort of look at that and maybe explore having our own typeface or at least optimizing and improving what we had. Um, so we started looking around at the, the media world and a lot of organizations such as The Guardian or ITV or Sky or CNN, Channel 4, Gov UK, et cetera, they'd all introduced their own uh, typeface families um, to improve their legibility, but equally to sort of boost their brand. 
their visual distinctiveness. So there's an opportunity to fix legibility issues, concerns, uh, bring ourselves a more distinctive sort of typographic tone of voice, as I mentioned before. And then the third thing which helped push this through was this idea of saving money because we were spending a lot of money on licensing typefaces at the BBC. Um, and if we owned our own typeface, then we would obviously there'd be some upfront cost to that, but we'd see a return on investment very quickly by retiring all of these font licenses, you see. So those were the three criteria that we that I sort of worked up into a, a essentially into a, like a, a proposal that went up to the executive board of the BBC. Now this took a while. I, I did a lot of traipsing around the organization and talking to people and, and getting stakeholder buy-in across the organization because introducing a typeface is a huge undertaking that was placed at the BBC. Um, but eventually it did get up to the executive board and was approved and there was almost like a response of well, why on earth aren't you doing this already you know we need to fix these problems and save us money which was fantastic and we got the green light and it was like wow okay we're going to introduce a typeface family fantastic what does that mean so what that means was you've got to get a hell of a lot of people across this initiative across the business people who don't deal with typefaces or even design on a regular basis and get them to understand the benefits of a good readable typeface or even understanding what typography is so we gathered together a group of stakeholders um, and really sort of got engaged them at the same time as we engaged a the, the right typeface agency so we, we put the call out to a number of british typeface design studios and dalton marg were the were the studio that came out by far on top. I mean, all these other studios put together really great proposals, but Dalton Marg had got this fantastic history of a portfolio of work of designing fantastically well-optimized typefaces for, for huge organ, giant organizations, broadcasting or tech companies or whoever it might be, um, including you know, things like the Amazon Kindle um, or uh, the Rio Olympic Games, et cetera. They'd done typefaces for all these fantastic things. The Nokia Pure typeface as well. So they had this great portfolio and, and, and really convinced our stakeholders that they were the, the guys for the job. So I took that group of stakeholders, key people from across the business, technical engineers, researchers, heads of product, senior marketing people, et cetera. And off we went to South London to Dalton Mark's office to begin our education. And that's where things really started to get interesting. And that's kind of the setup from my point of view. That's, that was the, that was the, the groundwork that had to be done to get the organization to buy into this but really it started to get interesting at this point when we started talking to bruno and his team okay so that's brilliant thanks david so bruno this obviously leads beautifully onto onto you so if you'd, you'd like to begin with your audio description and then tell us more Indeed. Um, so I'm Bruno. I am the founder and the chairman now of Dalton Mark, and we are a typeface design studio based in South London in Brixton. Um, audio description of myself is I'm a 50 year old white male, originally from Switzerland, you know, hence my slightly Germanic accent. Um, kind of like I would say, you know, in reasonably, good, in reasonably good shape, you know, for my age, uh, still have all my hair, you know, which uh, not many men can talk, can can proudly say, and uh, I wear glasses as well, you know, as with age, you know, deterioration of one's facilities, you know, is starting to happen, um, but yeah, so that's broadly about me. Um, thank you, David, for the um, the lovely introduction there. Um, so when the BBC approached us uh, with a, with kind of like a vague idea of a brief of what it needed to be done, we first needed to evaluate actually what it is the BBC needed. So there's a very there's, there's a, is an important distinction between need and want. You know they're often quite very different things, and uh, obviously the BBC being a, a public company or. Uh, uh, they also needed to be accessible, in a sense, to everyone, from anyone from five years old to 85 years old. And that has very specific requirements to a typeface and to typography uh, in, by and large. And for us, it was important in workshops with the BBC before we even started drawing any letters to evaluate what it is exactly they mean by accessibility. And we work always on the premise that there is three parts to accessibility. 
emotional accessibility, so how you feel about things and and how whether it's warm or cold or how inviting it is. You have a functional accessibility, which is really how the typeface functions in terms of a human perspective. Can you read it? So the legibility, the readability, and then you have a technical accessibility, the actual font software, the thing that sits on your computer, does it comply with the system requirements? Does it have the necessary linguistic support? Support, For example, one of the requirements with the BBC was that it would support Russian with Cyrillic characters. You know, in many people's view, that sort of thing is almost a given, you know, because you think, okay, I'm going to type Russian, but the reality is that most typefaces that are out there do not support anything beyond Western European or even Eastern European languages. So these characters need to be designed specifically. So we, as part of the process of designing a typeface, pretty much with any client, we went through a series of workshops with the BBC and all the stakeholders to evaluate, first of all, their emotionality, you know, and to establish a common vocabulary across all parties. So when we talk about each other, about what a typeface needs to express, we all use the same words, we all use the same language, we actually understand each other. Because if I say to you, oh, this typeface feels warm, you probably have a completely different imagination of that than I have. So through a series of exercises, we, we established that vocabulary. We also established a typographic vocabulary words and expressions that we as typographers use to describe a part of a character or the anatomy of a typeface in general. So we established those vocabularies so that there wouldn't be any misunderstandings in the communication and we all knew exactly what we were talking about. And this whole process of, um, of these workshops also allowed us to start building expectation management. What we would expect as the producers of the typeface, what we would expect from the BBC and the st stakeholders, and what the BBC and its stakeholders could expect from us. And that is also very, very important. With all these um, workshops then done, we finalized a brief, uh, which everyone signed off. And again, it's expectation management. And then we started designing. So several several of our designers in the studio started contributing and interpreting that brief and establishing a basic visual language of what the typeface could look like. Now, you don't do that on the entire alphabet because that would be far too labor intensive and would far too long, long, long to take. You have a handful of characters. Usually it's about you know, around 10 characters. Uh, that established the basic structure and the basic expression and look and feel of the typeface. With that, then you can already establish a direction. We presented about 10 different variants of the typeface and 10 different interpretations of that brief. And from that, two design directions were chosen, which we then explored further into a design concept. The design concept then was expanded into the capitals and the lower cases, the numerals, and a handful of punctuations to allow the BBC and to allow us to set dummy copy and to actually start putting the typeface onto devices into real life applications to see how the fonts interact from a visual point of view, how they interact with the content and the visual environment of the BBC identity, and also how they, how they function, not only technically, but you know, from a functionality point of view, from a legibility point of view in the different environments as well. And this is sort of like the moment you start testing and because and that, at that moment in time when you have this design concept and you start doing testing, you really need to take the human being in, into account. You need to understand that, for example, if you, a, if you are a 60 year old person, your visual acuity is only, is only about 20% of that of a 20 year old. So, that means that, for example, the implementation of a typeface on a mobile device, you know, kind of like, this is where we nowadays read off, 
um, it has to be, the letters have to be strong enough so as not to completely disappear and washed out because as an older person, I can't actually physically see it because my eyes do not have enough receptors to, with a fine enough resolution to really make out all the lines and all the parts of the, of, of, of the character. But it's not only the eyes, a far more important part is actually the brain, how the whole neuroscience of how we read, you know. So once that visual input comes into the eye and is converted into electrical impulses, it, it, impulses, it then travels along the optic nerve to the back of your brain where your visual cortex sits, where basically all imagery is being collected. The visual cortex then, distributes that image into different parts of the brain for various activities such as facial recognition, object recognition, spatial orientation, and one part in specific, which is visual word form area, which is basically the decoding and the recognition of any writing in any writing system in any language. And the visual word form area is a tiny little part of the brain usually in the vast majority of people sitting in the left hemisphere of your brain, just at the top and behind of your ear, you know, and it's a tiny little area, maybe the size of your fingertip. And that little area decodes every single letter. From there, the letters get put together into letter pair combination and eventually into entire word shapes. And the word shape then is being sent to the front of the brain into your semantic area where meaning is attached to that visual shape. But sometimes depending on language and depending on the word, the meaning cannot be detected from the visual shape alone, at which point that visual shape is being sent into the phonological area. And we're still in the left hemisphere here. Um, which sits right next to the primary auditory cortex and just above the visual word form area. And in that area, a sound is being attached to that visual shape. And together with visual shape and sound shape, the semantic area can then successfully attach meaning to the word. Now, this is a continuous feedback loop. It goes round and round and round at, an, at, at great speed. Uh, and this is how you read. At that point, you can also sort of like go off and say, okay, we can introduce uh, uh, reading disabilities, for example, dyslexia. And uh, contrary, contrary to popular belief, dyslexia actually has very little to do with reading and very much to do with sound. So it's not a visual deficiency, it's a, a phonological deficiency. And what that means is, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a very um, crude example here. What that means, if your brain cannot successfully distinguish between the sound B and P, then your brain has no chance to correctly map the sound B to the shape B or P to the shape P which then means when you have a word shape, the semantic area cannot successfully detect what the meaning is of the word. And dyslexia is obviously, it's a neuro, neuro, neurological condition, uh, but dyslexia has a very high occurrence in English speaking language, in English speaking uh, areas. Uh, approximately 15% of the population are affected by dyslexia, as opposed to say, Italian speakers or German speakers, where you only have about 7% of the speakers being affected. And the reason is the language itself. La English is a very opaque language where basically nothing spells how it is, how it sounds, you know. Whereas in Italian or in German, you have very much a one-to-one -one mapping of letter shapes to sounds. And where trip, where people trip, it's primarily the exceptions to the rules. You know, whereas in English, everything is an exception, you know, so hence you got that high occurrence of dyslexia, but it is primarily and research over the last 10 years has pretty much established that it is primarily a phonological deficit, you know, it's got very little to do with uh, the, the visual environment. Um, Interestingly as well, dyslexia also has a, a, a gen genetic identifiers, so you can be predisposed 
to uh, dyslexia through your genetic coding. You know, there's there's various other things, but that will be a, a presentation for the next three hours. Um, so, anyways, we are then uh, doing the testing for the typeface to make sure that it behaves correctly from a functional point of view, but also from a technical point of view. And at that point, we will have tested that design concept already on a, on a number of devices, on a number of techn technical backgrounds. And at that point, we can confidently make a decision. Um, and in this instance, with the BBC, we were able to make a confident decision as to which design concept to go further and then really to go into uh, execution of the full character set. And, um, and the full character set, particularly in the Latin environment, you know, will usually contain about 350 characters. So you add Cyrillic you know, for, for the, the languages spoken of the former Soviet Union. So that's not only Russian, but many others. So you're looking at another 120 characters. So you have easily about 500, 550 characters in that font that have to be drawn up across all the various styles, you know, from light to regular to bold to extra bold in a condensed, as well as all the italic. Uh, characters to then in order to build that typeface system which then allows the BBC um, to create different hierarchies within the lay layouts and to actually with a very simple typeface system and we both have a sans serif and a serif it allows the BBC to then create uh, actually different identity personalities across their products and their services as well without having to change the typeface altogether you know and uh, i think at that point i can hand over to gareth <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so that's, bruno <laughs> that's brilliant it's absolutely fascinating I've, I've got a list of questions here that i'll have to ask you afterwards um also just on questions if anyone does have any questions please do feel free to um send them in the chat and hopefully we'll have time at the end with these guys to ask them a few questions and if you don't um get your question answered then after the event i know that um AbilityNet are going to be pulling together some FAQs, so hopefully you'd then get your question answered there and it would all be held together. So thank you very much again, Bruno, for that. It was brilliant. Um, Gareth, could I ask you to give your audio description as well? Um, and off you go. Hi, Fred. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so for anyone who, who saw me earlier uh, chatting to Mark, I still look the same, but I will say that I'm another 50-something-year-old white male um, wearing glasses, um, uh, not quite in as good a shape as the other two, uh, and a lot less hair. Um, and I'm sat in a in a in in a, a bedroom turned office, which seems to be half the world at the minute. <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is where I'm. So yeah, I, I'm picking up from from where Bruno said. I mean, a little bit of background on this. I mean, we we sort of identified this is a subject area probably as early as 2008 when we had a new uh, divisional director joined us at the BBC and they wanted to change something and make their mark on .co.uk and one of the things let's change the typeface and we realized we had a choice at that time it was, it was Ariel or Vedana and it was the only way we could guarantee it would work on everything and uh, I can't remember which one it was I think we were on Vedana so we moved to Ariel you know and then someone else joins and then we move back again it it was just it, that that was about as in depth as it went. But it started us asking questions, and it started us looking into this. And and you know there were there's there's a lot of mythology around typeface accessibility. You know you hear the thing about serif versus sans serif, and I think there was there was a lot being uh, touted as fact in those days. And then when you looked at the actual research if you dug back far enough you found that actually there was research done on old green screen monitors back in the 1980s that couldn't render serifs and and you know and there was stuff on there was a broadcast font called tiresias that was a visual font for televisions and it was only ever tested in pa on paper uh, with about five people and the paper actually at the end said it was anecdotal and yet these things these mythologies built up around that and of course comic sans which you know, if you want everything to look like a nursery newsletter is a brilliant choice. 
Um, so it, it and that's where that, that there is no evidence really beyond anecdote. And to quote Jamie Knight, you know, the plural of anecdote isn't data. Um, so it's you know th th we were kind of in this kind of situation, and then UView came along, which was Project Canvas at the BBC, and it started off as a project inside the BBC, and then we got involved with lots of partners, with British Telecom and Channel Four, Channel Five, ITV, etc., all and others to build a new platform. And uh, and it was an opportunity to look at this, but still we were very very green in this area. We didn't know where to look for the for the uh, research, um, and and we were really 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 struggling finding things. And we made a choice, and it wasn't a bad choice for the system font. But we knew there was we came out with so many unanswered questions, and so there was lots of stuff in WCAG. But WCAG was all about what you do to a font, how you apply it. And so we realized, I think you're probably misquoting Jared Smith here, but you, you, you know, by, by applying those rules to a bad choice, you're putting, you know, accessibility lipstick on the usability pig. It's, uh, you know, you, you're not really going to get anywhere because the foundation was wrong and we, but we didn't know how to find that. And then lo and behold, this opportunity comes along, David contacts me and said, do you, do you want to get involved in this project that we're doing? And you know, and introduced myself to Bruno. And I am dyslexic, by the way. And until I met Bruno, I never before particularly wanted to be Italian or German. But realised my upbringing would have been a lot easier if I had. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, you know, that's it. So you know, curse is the English language. Um, but uh, yeah, it's my my natural enemy. I found out at the end of it. But we, we, this was it, and and it was going through this kind of process. Is, is you know, it took a long time, and as as David and Bruno have both talked to, you know, building that language and understanding, we all had to understand as much about reading and how reading works for lots of different groups of people to actually understand the types of choices that we were going to make, and not be drawn into anecdotes. There's a lot of anecdotes around accessibility fonts out there. There's there's you know, and there's a lot of things that that say, "Hey, we're a we're a magic bullet font." And when you start digging into it, it's it's all it's very 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 surface research that's done, a little bit of anecdote and a lot of supposition, and and so going through this process for us was a really really important thing. And um, and we realised really coming out the end of it from an accessibility point of view, we've learned an enormous amount. We've been able to achieve quite a lot. But it, it, it's such a huge I mean, reading itself as, as the way that it happens for different human beings is such a complicated thing that this actual subject for, for the three of us opened up a lot you know, further, probably a lot more for David and myself than Bruno, <laughs> but who's, been, who's been researching this for you know, many, many more years than we have. Um, but it, it's a fascinating area and, and it's not one of those things it, it it also as bruno said there's this kind of balance that needs to be struck you know because wreath had to function but it also had to feel like the bbc you know we had to the bbc is nearly 100 years old 98 years old is it david i can't remember it's it's roughly that you know so we're heading towards our centenary it has a history and so whatever we put up there had to fit within that history but then fit within its need to to deliver to the audience and and so there's always these kind of balances of of you know, this functional and emotional accessibility and technical because it also has to work across all those platforms um, that we were constantly battling with but the research itself was was fascinating and and testing particularly we looked at dyslexia we we went vision impairment and dyslexia actually when it comes down to it having in this space have incredibly similar uh, requirements um, and and so you know testing with you know mixed ability user groups of different ages different reading abilities um, in different contexts whether we were looking at different screen sizes we were testing in for um, subtitles and subtitle display we were looking at tickers and moving graphics as well as on-screen graphics and and the contexts were incredibly wide and so we were looking for those moments where we were we were looking for problematic areas and looking for performance. But I think one of the things I can't remember, Bruno, if you said this earlier, is one of the things we do know is that the more you are exposed to a font, the longer you, the better, the more actually usable it becomes because your brain gets used to it. You're trained over a long period of time. So we were introducing something that people were unfamiliar with and then trying to train against it. So we picked benchmarks like our incumbent fonts 
and some industry benchmarks as well and saying this has to be a, a, you know it has to perform at least as well and when we ended up going through through the actual testing itself it, it outperformed um, the other fonts and that was that kind of thing when we knew we, we were going in a really really good direction but yeah really for, I mean for, for from my point of view it was that it, there's been a, a, quite an enormous journey but we feel like we there's still an enormous amount to learn in this area and and as an, an industry as an accessibility industry this is one of those foundations that we've never really got to grips with um and it's it's something it's on everything you cannot escape from type and yet it's one of those things that we've skirted around and uh, and we've looked for quick solutions um when really we need we need more data more understanding more research um and uh, and that's kind of you know been the beauty of um how how, how long has did the wreath process take to to look for david how long from from idea to to deliver first delivery it was about oh gosh about three or nearly four years yeah but that was but that but but to be fair it was a sort of a side project that i was kicking around for a long time when it got into yeah. actually making it it went quite quickly yeah <laughs> But there was a lot of research. There was a lot of stuff behind it. We pulled in so much. We were, look, was, we were, look, we were, look, we yeah. were looking for stuff that wasn't there. We were looking yeah. for answers that weren't, that didn't exist. And I think that that's what Bruno, myself, and Gareth are now digging into. We want, we want to, we want to find the answers. But actually, one of the things that you picked up on Gareth, you know, which is also interesting, is this idea that we read best what we are used to reading. You know, and it's absolutely true. But I think we also need to go a step further and it comes down to function, functionality is that it has to be clear and it has to be understood that we are not born with the ability to read. You have to learn it and you have to practice it and you have to keep at it. You know, the more you read, the better you get at it. You know, it's like playing an instrument. It's like doing anything, you know. You you have to keep practicing and even if you're having a read have a reading disability and i of course understand that if you have a disability it makes it so much harder to practice and then it's very easy to sort of say okay i'm not going to do that but that's a vicious circle because then the less you do it the more the more uh, it's it, the more the whole thing becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if you see what i mean so on the contrary, you know, if you do have, you know, a reading disabilities, you know, and it's easy for me to say, I understand that, but keep at it, you know, keep at it, keep practicing it because that's the only way you can actually maintain a functionality of mm. it. I think one of those things, is there, was, there was some fascinating little moments for me all the way through it. I think one of them was, the concept that um, there are as many congenitally blind dyslexic people proportionally as there are sighted. Um, I think there was yeah. a study. Which university yeah. was it? That... Um, university of Bristol. Yes, indeed. Yeah. They did a study uh, where they wanted to find out the arithmetic abilities of uh, congenitally blind people. So in essence, what they had to do is put blind people into an MRI scanner and have them read Braille script. What they found was that whilst reading Braille script, which is obviously tactile input, the visual word form area, which was mentioned, I was mentioning earlier, which decodes all letter shape, was lighting up. So, which is a totally unexpected uh, uh, result. What they've also found is that blind people can be dyslexic, which then further supports the notion that, it is, that dyslexia is a phonological condition and not a visual condition. Very fascinating. Um, I mean, <laughs> there's so much I, to I, dig into. Here. I, I, you know, <laughs> from a science point of view, I find that quite cool. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That is, it's incredibly fascinating. So in terms of how long you guys have all been working together now, has the um, has that relationship continued? Do you kind of continue to support Bruno in terms of this thing or, or do you kind of say, right, okay, we've, we've started to roll it out now. 
let's let's move on. I mean, the, the, with regard to uh, Dalton Mark's relationship with BBC, it's continue. It, it continues. They're called, we consider them like the guardian of our typeface family, and that's in, that's expanding all the time. So we have we've just we've just built the um, the Arabic face uh, into the into the language set as well. So um, so that that can, that relationship continues. But I think that myself, Gareth, and Bruno have just formed a friendship now mm. that has become a sort of friendship with a bottle of wine, discussing typefaces, moving slowly into this kind of interest group that we're sort of, it's kind of a little R&D project for us on the side Indeed. that we just, we just yeah. kind of can't let go of. Because yeah. we've, done, we've done a great job for the BBC. The BBC has a, a really high performing typeface, right? That's great. But it kind of has to stop there. We have to move on to other things. And we have to we have to maintain it and keep it running well and all those things. Mm. But actually, there's a hell of a lot more that we want to know and learn about, and that's why that yeah. friendship's continued. Yeah. But We've I all think, become very nerdy about the stuff at the BBC. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I didn't mention when I was doing the little build up was was about how once we started sitting down with Bruno and his team and learning all of this stuff, right? It's incredible how fast people who have no interest in typography or typefaces, these stakeholders that we, we brought in, became fascinated with typography, type design, and they were flushed with excitement going back to their respective teams and talking about typography. And that, from a strat strategic point of view, was really canny because I built up this kind of like this group of ambassadors around the BBC that spread the, the love of type design. And so that by the time the typeface came around, they were all hungry for it. Mm. And so it, it wasn't easy, but equally it was, it was wonderfully nerdy. And um, that's one thing that I can say with some confidence. It, it doesn't get boring, this subject. Yeah, but I think you're also touching on another important point, you know, by saying that we've kind of like just sort of like been working on the Arabic for it as well. You know, in the West, we have a very Western-centric view of the world, you know, and it is the Latin writing system, that's it. The reality, of course, is that the Latin writing system is the dominant writing system in the world. That's geopolitical, historical uh, reasons behind that. But another reality is also that the Arabic writing system is natively used by about 1.3 billion people on this planet. You know, as is Chinese, 1.3 billion people. There is other writing systems on this planet that are used by hundreds of millions. Um, currently, there are about 40 different writing systems that are actively used and are alive and kicking by a substantial number of people. There's over 100 writing systems altogether that are still in use today, you know, many of them only by like by very small minorities where you literally have maybe a dozen speakers who can still read and write a specific writing system. But nonetheless, they are alive writing systems. So, so uh, as, a, as a world, we really need to start understanding that. And then the thing is, when you start designing for another writing system, say Arabic, you know, you, you, you're finding yourselves having to deal with a whole host of cultural implications as well. You will find that one part, say, for example, the Arab world, you know, they prefer a specific style over uh, the style that is preferred in the Persian world or in the Asian world. You know, and then you have to start becoming like a chief political negotiator to bring all these worlds together and create a compromise, you know, which everyone can sign up to, you know, without being offended, for example. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just a fascinating world, you know. Yeah. This is why I think everyone is getting so nerdy about it, because, because there is so much involved, you know, when you start talking about letter forms, you know. Mm -hmm. So with, with that, talking about those um, different styles, when you went through the testing phase, do you, do you test against every style that you then create? Or do you obviously have to limit which styles that you test on? Well, with the testing, you usually have, you know, as I say, you usually have two or three candidates, you know, of, of typeface. And you usually do the testing with a regular font style, you know, because the regular is really the workhorse, you know, that's what's used every single day. Uh, and, 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 
and that is really what people are reading you know so you're testing it against that and let's say you have maybe two or three design candidates which you test against one another you mm -hmm. know and then you can really take the learnings from that and then expand that into the different styles say a bold or a light you know mm -hmm. and you can be fairly confident that whatever you do and that's obviously also the skill of, of, of a typeface designer to translate those learnings into the different styles and apply them there in the knowledge that the typeface will still perform according to the style that they have. Mm -hmm. and, and could you envisage in the future kind of further variants of the wreath font or, or do you think that you've got enough now? I think that's a question for David really. <laughs> I mean I think it's where there's a business need so we, we did the Arabic um, family because of the we have because of our world service um but um when it comes to say like chinese letter set etc i mean that that's huge and that's or indian languages you know the, the huge it, it becomes huge and it's just how big an audience we actually have for that now yeah. versus the cost of making it so the character set for chinese language i mean t tell me bruno oh um, it's it's a have. minimum of twenty eight thousand. yeah so it's it's yeah. it's absolutely crazy so that so it's if we have a neat business case for it then yes but i think we've pretty much covered the languages that we serve currently uh, yeah we, we, uh, we currently do i think as, as a as an organization we we supply services in about 44 different 45 different languages somewhere around about there but i think the actual set that we've got how many hundreds of languages about do we currently about 120 it covers uh, yeah 120 or 150 even now what we have the arabic yeah. included as well because again the latin alphabet you know obviously covers so many languages in itself that the latin alphabet in itself is already about 100 languages and then you add the cyrillic you know which covers a, a wide range of languages as well all of the former so forms so of course of be small we also have these smaller languages like Pidgin and Igbo yeah. and, and mm. other languages that, like that, which, yeah. we, which we built in as well. So there are yeah. extensions to the Latin set. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And in terms of um, uh, when you were rolling out, certainly in terms of the wreath, um, so I guess David or Gareth, this would be for you. When you were rolling out that wreath um, onto all of your platforms, how long did it take have you have you even got there yet have you rolled it out everywhere now or is it still an ongoing process thanks you david <laughs> um i would say that the the we've done the lion's share of it uh, there, there are legacy pages obviously that don't have it but they'll be retired eventually anyway um we've moved pretty much all of our main shop windows or our main service services over to it mm. um, there's some areas of the beat of the new service which is a vast service that haven't um implemented it yet but that's due to technical legacy and uh, mm. updates to our infrastructure from a technical mm. point of view but we're almost there i would say yep. um there's there, but bbc has so many thousands of pages yeah. and old apps and old bits and pieces and old wiring that it's bound to not be everywhere everywhere yeah but because we are retiring our typeface licenses that's forcing us to do real thorough audits of where where helvetica for instance amongst many other like typefaces are still existing yeah. and then retiring those pages or or implementing the typeface over in, into those into those spaces and and when this, so this whole, oh, sorry so sorry. when this kind of process of rolling out started did you get much um uh, much response from the public or internally what was the kind of general yeah. feel surprisingly um it wasn't we we whenever the bbc does something new we get a lot of feedback let's call it okay and that and, and surprisingly we didn't get that much negative feedback about the typeface the first mm. service that we implemented it on was the sport service so sport across sport across tv and web and etc um, and these are fanatical fans that you that you sports sports fans are fanatical right and they and they use the sports service every day millions of people use it every week and so um but actually they really liked uh, uh, you know when you gathered all the responses together it was pretty much you know universally kind of not universally every, the, the large majority of people preferred the new typeface they liked the modernity that it introduced they didn't have any issue with it there were some people that didn't like it aesthetically but that's kind of subjective so we can take or leave that and there was very few complaints from an accessibility point of view or concern so mm. 
we felt you know there was there was some high fiving going on for sure, <laughs> but of course there'll be some opinion, and we can't we can't please everybody, but from the testing and the data that we put behind it, and the the beauty of this typeface because it's a very beautiful typeface. Yeah, you know we we we've done a good job we think. Yeah, with the complaints, they're always an interesting one with the BBC because one I think as as Charlie said earlier, you know the best thing that we get is silence. Um, and that's the biggest compliment we can ever have from our user base. But, you know, sometimes as well, when you do get complaints, one of those things you need to work out is, is this someone with an actual barrier, is facing an actual barrier, or is it someone with an opinion that there may be a barrier? Yep. And so you have to dig in. And we always do. We look at we look at these things and often sometimes people turn around and, and present and we go, we, we have a look, we may contact them, we may have a look into the issue, and sometimes it can be either way, and it's either opinion or an actual thing. If it's an actual thing, we, we then investigate much further because we want to know the nature of it and that kind of impact. And is it one of those things where there is uh, coping strategies around it? I mean, you know, having dyslexia and ADHD, you know, I know, I know all about coping strategies, but it, you know, some things you can make adjustments, other things it's, it's the end. There's no way through that's, that's a proper barrier. And yeah. so, you know, there was always that kind of thing with balancing different people's needs. And, and so particularly with people with vision impairment, you know, you can't turn legibility up. Yeah. <laughs> you can, turn, yeah. but you, there's other things that you can adjust. And so when you were looking at the feedback, we were looking at the people who would really benefit and would, you know, and, and the, the, you know, sort of the, the, the impacts of some of the other things, anything that you design, anything that you create, you know, give me anything in the world, I'll find you someone that, that can't use it, you know, that's it, that's the nature of, 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 of humanity and, and the things that we design. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's so much variant in 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 you know human being and and thing that we're trying to use and in context that we're trying to use it. But it's trying to understand is that you know how how impactful it is. And really, there was there was virtually nothing that came back of of any substance. I mean, for me, for me as a typeface designer, you know, it's actually it's always confirming that the best work that the best work is the work that no one notices. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you know, and the thing generally that applies to design, you know, that's you know when you know you've done good design, when people just use it, mm. and that's it. Mm. Yeah. So we've 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 got about three minutes left. So um, I'm going to bring in some more questions from the audience. So um, one of the questions that have been asked is is how long do you think the research will continue into this kind of thing at the BBC? Is it something that you've kind of got an ongoing commitment to? You know, where where does that kind of stand? So I guess either Gareth or David. I, I, it's it's we're probably you know, unless we unless we, we we go into another writing system, unless there is one of those as a business need, is to you know when we started looking at the Arabic character set, set that kicked off a little bit of research again because we needed to understand, you know, sort of the implications around people who were you know sort of native. Uh, speakers of Arabic and and again with various conditions and we did some reach out to various organizations um, and, uh, and and to find users and to do testing but it's one of those where I think it's all down to, to again as, as David has said is that kind of business need and the evolution and there may be there may be further further projects to be had out of that but it has to be determined by the evolution of the font itself mm. the typeface family itself so but I think outside of it, with the three of us, and there's a, another friend who's involved as well, you know, it, it's furthering our own understanding and, and mm. furthering kind of knowledge in general around this. And because there's so, still a lot of questions that, that need to be asked and, uh, and there's a lot more exploration that needs to be had. Um, I, oh yeah, so David. I would, I would, sorry, I would say, David. I, would say that there, I, think I would say that there's one area that we haven't, probably explored um and that would be in sort of immersive environments so things like mm. augmented reality or vr parametric typography etc and i know that bruno's done some study on that stuff but that may very well come around for us because if, as we move into that world with 5g and more you know all sorts of new technology we might be wearing on our faces and looking through you know uh, what does that mean for our legibility of, of, of ebc reads so yeah there could be some more research on it Okay, thank you. And another question that's come in um, specifically for Bruno, and uh, someone has actually asked what um, what design no nos are there in terms of um, typography design? Do you have a, a particular non favourite? Um, tight letter spacing. Stop 
stop spacing characters too tightly. It's an absolute nightmare, even for a proficient reader without any disabilities whatsoever. It's a nightmare. It reduces legibility, it reduces readability, it reduces comprehension. You know, generally trust your local typeface designers. They tend to have a good idea of what they're doing. You know, just leave it, use it as it is. You know. Thank you. And, and one more question. Bruno, do you have a favorite font? Oh my God. It, 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 <laughs> Apart from Reef, obviously. Apart from Reef, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, Honestly, that changes. That changes with the mood of the day. You know, uh, sometimes it's Comic Sans. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's that's Brilliant. that's mostly to rile people. But um, yeah. Yeah, you know, but uh, if you know, I keep saying, if I had to do the hard choice and take one one font, one typeface to the desert island, I think it yeah. would have to be Universe. It's maybe not necessarily the most of accessible typefaces, but for me, this is modernity, clarity, cleanness. It's, 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 for me, it's a piece of beauty. <laughs> yeah, okay. And I think we might have just a few seconds left. So Gareth and David, same question to you. Favorite font? BBC Reef. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, we'll take I, that out. Uh, yeah. Apart from me. <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know. I, I, I've had a successful career in design using Helvetica a lot, and I still have some love for it. You know, I do. I do still really like it. I like its anonymous nature and its and its kind of information enus however i've done so much learning since that through doing bbc reef that i now find myself being much more fascinated with humanist typefaces rather than grotesque typefaces which is what helvetica is so yeah yeah, yeah. That would yeah. Be my answer. I, I i will actually turn the question on its head and say i actually have ones that i don't like and they're mostly the ones that tell me that I'm, they're accessible to me because they're not <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, it, it's one of those things where there's a lot of accessible fonts knocking around at the minute and they just don't work. It, it's they may work for some people. But we don't know why, but then not they're not they're not what they claim to be. There's a there's a, a lot of. Um, yeah. Snake again, oil, I think, yeah. is the best way I think, of describing uh, it. Again, this is also part and parcel of that, you know, the initiative that Gareth, David and I and, and Michael, the other friend are doing. Uh, busting some of these myths you know and busting this kind of like throwing around you know the word accessibility you know willy-nilly you know just to, to make some few few more marketing dollars you know it's uh that needs to that needs to stop you know and 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 if we can successfully do that and i think we can actually advance accessibility as well yeah brilliant well thank you very much indeed